any thoughts on how we are going to go about this limit? What's the first thing we should do with this limit? Plug the nine in. Plug in the nine. All right, if we plug in the nine, what do we get? We get nine minus nine over root nine minus three, which is? Zero over zero. Zero over zero. You'll find a pattern that like, not very many of the limits that we deal with will just come out to be a number because those are just too easy, right? It's just like evaluating things. You could have done that in second grade. So this is indeterminate, which means we've got to find some way to deal with it. How are we going to deal with it? Anybody? Any ideas? What's one way that we've dealt with these in the past already? Yesterday. Um, isn't it a whole again or isn't it a what? A hole or something. Yeah, it does have a hole at x equals nine. That's true. But how are we going to evaluate the limit? We gotta find a way to evaluate the limit. Do we do something like we square the whole thing and then factor it from there? All right. That's not 100% right, but it's sort of on the right track. Um, yeah, we're going to need to multiply both the numerator and the denominator of this by something, or at least that's one method that we can use. So we're actually going to do this one in two different ways. So watch this. It's going to be really exciting. I'm going to like, yeah, we're going to do it two different ways. All right. So one way is to multiply by something. And probably sometime in the last couple of years, you learned some rules about how to get rid of radicals that were in denominators and you had to do like the rationalization junk, right? You have to do like rationalization to get rid of those radicals. Yeah. Yeah, and so when you had an expression like, let's say root x minus three, or you probably, you probably didn't have an x, and they probably gave you something like root two plus one or something. How did you get rid of that radical? What did you multiply by? Anybody remember? Root x plus three. Exactly. Yeah, you multiplied by what do we call that? Multiplied the by the inverse. The conjugate. Conjugate. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Multiplying by the conjugate. Right. So we're going to turn this into the limit as x approaches nine of x minus nine times root x plus three over root x minus three times the root x plus three. And the whole reason that we're gonna do that is that's gonna turn the denominator into, well, root x times root x is just x, right? And then root x times three is a three root x. And then a root x times a negative three is a negative three root x. So those end up canceling out with each other. And then we just have the negative three times the three, which are the minus nine. And we'll note that x minus 9 ought to, in just a moment here, cancel with the x minus 9 in the numerator, giving us a limit as x approaches 9 of just root x plus 3. Everybody good with that? Cancel those out. Which is just root 9 plus 3, or Six. Good with that or no? Yes. Easy. Yeah? All right. Spectacular. That's great. So there's another way we could have done this also. We could have also done this um, just by factoring. Now you might look at that and be like, well, that doesn't factor. Okay. Well, it does. Um, pretty much anything factors. It just depends on how you choose to factor it. Um, x minus 9 is something minus something else. If I wanted to, I could always turn this, if it's just a term minus some other term, I could always make that into a difference of squares. And so I could turn this limit as x approaches 9 into, well, how do you factor a difference of squares? It's the square root of the first term and the square root of the second term, right? And one of them 
gets a plus between them and the other one gets a minus between them. Everybody see that? Good with that? Yep. Yep. And then what do we got here? We got the root x minus threes will cancel. So we just have the limit as x approaches nine of root x plus three. This method's a little bit quicker and easier, right? Um, and it ends up just being the same thing as what we had on the other side. So either way, we'll get the same answer, which makes sense. Should get the same answer. Um, just up to you the method that you want to use for it. Everybody good with that or no? Yes. All right. Excellent. Let's do another one. You'll probably know this one looks very similar. Any thoughts on what we might do here? Multiply it by um, 4 plus x over 4 plus x. All right, so if we do the 4 plus x, do the 4 plus x. Four plus. Four plus. Uh, I think your audio is kind of cutting out. Oh, you guys hear me all right or now? Oh, okay, now it's good. Okay, so if I multiply by four plus x, x that's going to turn the numerator is not going to change, but the denominator is going to turn it. 16 minus x squared. Um, and unfortunately, that's not going to give us anything that's going to cancel out. Is it? I don't see it. So we're going to have to multiply by And generally, just, just like you, when you try to rationalize uh, different, different denominators, different pieces of functions, you always have to do it with the radical portion. So what we're probably going to do here is add the root x. Oh. Hmm. And that's going to work out a little bit better. Always, if you're going to multiply by a conjugate of something, do it with the piece that is a radical piece. So we're going to have the limit as x approaches 4. And then the root x times the root x gives us an x. And the root x and the 2 and the root x and the negative 2 cancel. And then the negative 2 and the 2 give us a minus 4. And we got a small issue here still. Um, but before we talk about that, everybody OK with what we've done? Yeah. So the issue is now we still don't have anything to cancel out. We've got an x minus 4. And we got a 4 minus. Okay. It's very similar. But what do I need to do to one of them to make it so that they'll cancel out? Multiply either the top or bottom by a minus sign. Okay. And so we can't just multiply by a negative sign, but that's the right idea. What we've got to do is factor out a negative sign to the top or the bottom. We can't just multiply the top or the bottom by a negative sign. I'm doing the bottom also. So if I factor out a negative from the top, that's going to be negative minus that. root x and we'll see that those four minus x's now cancel out we've got the limit as x approaches four of negative one we'll say over root x plus two which we can now just plug in the four giving us negative one over root four plus two or negative ready good with that or now yeah all right. No questions? Everyone's good? Let's move on to another one then. I was going to say, I did that one by breaking up the net 4 minus x into, like, I, I factored that. Is that cool? Yeah, that's great too. Yeah, that, just like we did the last one, that's fine. You could have gotten 2 minus root x and 2 plus root x and then factored a negative out of that. Is that what you did? Yeah. Yes, thank you. 
Yeah, that's perfect. Yep. And and a lot of these problems will have multiple different ways to go about them, and I don't care which way you use, um, as long as it's a method that you know I've taught you about. Because <laughs> there's some other method, there's other methods to solve this limit that are different than what we've done so far, um, that we're going to learn about actually, and not for like another three or four weeks probably. So I'd rather you, if you're like you know, looking ahead at stuff, somehow don't use stuff we have about yet. But we've talked about that. So. All right, here we go. We got another one. The limit as x approaches zero of one over x plus four minus a fourth all over x. What should we do first? What should we always do first? Plug in the zero. Plug in the zero. Plug in that a value. One fourth minus a fourth over zero, which is zero over zero. So this is indeterminate. So we got to do something to deal with the fact that this is indeterminate. Anybody got a good idea of what we should do to, to deal with this? I don't know, maybe multiply by both sides by x plus 4 to cancel out the cancel out the denominator of the new one of the numerator numbers all right yeah that's that's uh, on the right track here we want to try and get some common denominators in here so that we can cancel out those denominators so there's really two sort of two ways to go about this um, one is to just take the piece of this this is called a complex fraction because it's a fraction with fractions inside of it is to take the piece of the complex fraction that has multiple different num or multiple different denominators to it and get a common denominator with them. Or yeah. the other option is to get a common denominator right this is x over one and then get them all to have a common um, Either way is good. Um, I'm gonna do it just by getting the numerator to all have a common denominator. So that common denominator ought to be x plus four times. So this should turn into a limit as x approaches zero. Uh, I multiply the one over x four by four over four. I'll have over and then minus this one needs to multiply by x four over x plus four. And then it's still all over x. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this x as an x over one because now I've got a fraction divided by another fraction. And we can deal with a fraction divided by another fraction by just multiplying by the reciprocal. So effectively, that's just going to put this x into the denominator with the 4 and the x. Everybody see that? Any issues with that, or is everybody OK with that? You, oh, OK, so you multiplied the first fraction in the top fraction by four in order to, okay, I get, uh, never mind. I got answered my question, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so I just got a common denominator in the numerator, and then I wrote the denominator as x over one and multiplied by the of x over one. Yeah, and combine those two fractions together. So now let's simplify down the numerator, because the numerator's got you know, a bunch of addition and subtraction with some like terms. So the limit is x over of four minus x minus four, so the four minus four is going to cancel out, so it's going to be left with a negative x over four x times x plus. And we can pull out from the numerator and the denominator, making us with negative one over four times x plus four. And now we'll plug in our zero. There's no more simplification for us to do here negative one over four times zero plus four, or negative one over six. Everybody good there? Yeah. All right. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of background noise. So if you're in between saying something, make sure you remute yourself. I'm not sure who, a couple people I think maybe are doing that. So if you, if you unmute yourself to say something, then try to remute yourself. I think that'll cut down the background noise. So, any questions on that one, or are we all good? All right. 
You guys want to try and do one on your own? Yeah. All right. I'll give you guys, I don't know, maybe two minutes to try and work through this one. Sort of similar to the last one, we got a complex fraction. So you're going to want to do a similar thing with getting a common denominator up here in the numerator. So I will give you guys about two minutes to look at that one and then we'll go through it together. What's the first thing you should have done with this one before doing anything else? Try the negative, negative three. Plug in the negative three, right? Which gives us one over negative one. So negative one plus one over negative three plus three. So clearly another zero over zero. Probably recognize that that's going to happen a lot. All right. So we got another indeterminate one. So this limit as x approaches negative three. Well, let's get a common denominator for the numerator. Well, one is just one over one, right? So the common denominator is just going to be x plus two. So we're going to have one over x plus two plus one times x plus two over x plus two all over that x plus three. And I'll put that over one so that I recognize I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal and throw that x plus three into the denominator. Everybody good there? Okay. And we got the limit as x approaches negative three. And then up here, we're going to have one plus x plus two, which is just going to be x plus three. And in the denominator, we're going to have x plus two. And then that x plus three is going to get thrown in there with it also. And we should then be able to easily cancel out the x plus threes, giving us a limit as x approaches negative three of one over x plus two, which is one over negative three plus two or negative one. Good or no? Yeah. All right. Spectacular. Everybody feeling all right so far with our limits? Yep. Good. Don't worry, they'll get more difficult. I know you're concerned. You're thinking this class is going to be too easy. All right, let's take a look at this. We've got the limit as x approaches zero of the cube root of x plus 27 minus three all over x. I'm gonna ask this every time, what's the first thing I should do? Plug in zero. Plug in the zero, all right. So, so what do I get? Cube root of 27 minus three over zero. Um, what's the cube root of 27? It's three, right? So three minus three, we got zero over zero, indeterminate. So what are we gonna do? How are we gonna fix this problem? It probably looks like this is one of those multiplying by the conjugate ones, right? Because I got a root and a minus something. And if we tried to multiply by cube root of this plus three, the, that's going to be a problem, actually, though, because multiplying by the conjugate only works for uh, square roots or even roots, and this is an odd root. So we're going to have to come up with something else. Probably don't see a real good way to factor out anything. What part of this is giving us the most trouble, do you think? The cube root. Yeah, all this all this cube root nonsense, right? This cube root of x plus 27. How about we just get rid of that? Anybody opposed to just like getting rid of it completely? Go for it. All right, that's the plan. Let's do it. We're going to let u equal the cube root of x plus 27. Okay. If I do that, what does the numerator of this limit become? u minus 3. 
That's spectacular, right? That's way better than the cube root of x plus 27 minus 3, isn't it? Yeah. But now I've got a limit as x approaches 0 of u minus 3 over x. Well, that's not any easier for us to deal with. We haven't done any of these things that have multiple variables in them. We, we won't. So what else do you think we need to do if we've taken the cube root of x plus 27 and turned it into a u term? Maybe get rid of the x. All right, let's get rid of the x. We got an x in the denominator. So if u is the cube root of x plus 27, then that ought to tell us that u cubed, I cube both sides of this, u cubed is equal to x plus 27, or that x is equal to u cubed minus 27. Everybody okay with that little bit of arithmetic there? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I'm not going to have a limit as x approaches zero of a bunch of stuff that's all in terms of u. So how about we figure out what happens as x approaches zero. As x approaches zero, u approaches the cube root of zero plus 27. Right, I just plugged in the x is approaching zero into my u equals. And what do I end up with? u is approaching this. Three? three. Is that you said? Sorry, you cut out for a second when you said that. But. Yeah, sorry, I said three. Three. Yep. So we're now going to convert this completely into a limit as u approaches three. That's like the worst U I've ever written in my life. That's so much better, I guess. The limit is U approaches 3 of U minus 3 over U cubed minus 27. All right, so now we've written it all in terms of another variable. So let's just plug it in. What do we get? In the numerator, we get 0. And in the denominator, we get 0. 0. Well, great. So we did all this work and we still have an indeterminate limit. But the good news is we now have something that no longer has this annoying cube root in it. We've got a new limit that's equivalent to the old limit that this one, we should be able to factor this denominator of u cubed minus 27. So we're going to write this as the limit as u approaches 3 of u minus 3 over, and then this is a difference of cubes. That's on your special factoring cases one. Remember that one? How do you factor that difference of cubes? It ought to be u minus 3 times u squared plus 3u plus 9. It would be good if you guys know how to factor those sums and differences of cubes because they show up a lot with these limits. And what can we do? We can cancel out the u minus 3s. We've now got a limit as u approaches 3 of 1 over u squared plus 3u plus 9, which is 1 over 3 squared plus 3 times 3 plus 9, or 1 over 9 plus 9 plus 9, 27. How do we feel about that? Good. Yeah, everybody's all right with that? Sure. Sure. That's uh, a little bit non-committal there. Anybody have questions on that? Would you recommend using um, U for anything with complicated terms, such as cube roots or higher? Um, I, if it's an odd exponent, or an odd root, then yeah, the u substitution is going to be the right way to go. If it's an even root, like you got a square root or a fourth root or something, generally then you can uh, 
you, you can probably use the multiplying by the conjugate rule to, to help with that. It might not always work out perfectly, but it usually will. So if it doesn't work out with the multiplying by the conjugate, then try it with the U sub. But even roots are a better bet to do it an easier way. All right. Let's do another one. We got the cube root of x plus eight squared minus four times the cube root of x plus eight plus four over x squared. What should we do first? Plug in. Plug it in. All right. So if I plug in zero, I'm going to have the cube root of eight, which is two, right? So two squared is four. And then I'm going to have another cube root of eight, which is two times this four. So that's going to be minus eight and then plus four over zero squared. And looks like that's zero over zero. Perfect. Okay. So we've at least shown that it's indeterminate. What do you think we should do? Uh, let u equal the cube root of x plus 8. Sounds good to me. We'll let u equal the cube root of x plus 8. And this time, let's go through and figure out what x is and all that stuff right off the bat. So if u is the cube root of x plus 8, then u cubed is x plus 8, or x is u cubed minus 8. And if x is approaching 0, what is u approaching? Negative eight. No, mm, uh, if x is approaching, x is approaching zero, then u should be approaching the cube root of zero plus eight, which ought to be two. Two. All right, cube root of eight or two. So this whole limit then should be rewritten as the limit as u approaches two, and cube root of x plus eight was our u, so that's u squared minus 4u plus 4 over u cubed minus 8 squared. And then what should we do? Probably plug in the 2. What does that give us? Gives us 4 minus 8 plus 4. That looks familiar over zero squared. Now that looks familiar too. Zero over zero. It's still indeterminate. So let's do what? Factor. Let's factor. What's the numerator factor too? U plus two, U minus two. Mm, no. U minus two, U minus two. U minus two, U minus two, or U minus two squared. All right. And then what about U cubed minus eight? It should be U minus two and U squared plus two U plus four. And I have two of those, right? So each of those is also squared. And the u minus 2 squares, which is what's causing the problem, right? Because each of those is equal to 0. Those will cancel. We've got the limit as u approaches 2 of 1 over u squared plus 2u plus 4 squared. Or 1 over 4 plus 4 plus 4 squared. Now that'd be 12 squared, which is 1 over 1. Any questions with that? Cool. All right, so those are some other techniques to use to find limits. So we've done factoring, we've multiplied by the conjugate, we did um, simplifying the complex fraction, and we've done these ones where you have to do a u substitution.
and get used to U substitutions this year. We're going to do a lot of U substitutions this year in every single topic that we cover. It's going to be great. Everyone feeling all right? Yes. All right. The majority of your homework tonight will be revolving around doing problems like the ones we've done so far today. Um, so the majority of it. So let's take a look at some other interesting things to think about. Let's think about the limit as x approaches 0 of the function 1 over x. Now, I've already told you here that it doesn't exist. Let's show why that's true. What does the function 1 over x look like? Does it have anything in the first quadrant? Yeah, point at uh, yes. 1, 1. Yeah, it's got, a, it's got a point at 1, 1, right? And I'm just going to sort of sort of sketch it. It's got, you know, it looks about like that. You know, that's not perfect because I didn't line it up real nicely with like the points and all that. Um, but that's basically what it looks like. True. And what about in the second quadrant? Is there anything in the second quadrant? No. Yeah, nothing in the second. What about the third? Yes. Yeah, same thing as in the first, except sort of mirrored. Uh, I didn't do that very well. I didn't do that very well. Get used to this, too. Me saying, oh, I didn't draw that very well, and then like trying it seven times, and it's still not looking good. Um, and then what about the fourth quarter? Nothing. Yeah, nothing. And what do we know about this function? We know it's got two different asymptotes, right? It's got a horizontal asymptote. At y, or, sorry, yeah, y equals zero, and it's got a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. Yeah. Um, and so just thinking about this, why can we say that this limit doesn't exist? Because of the asymptotes, it can't cross x equals one or zero, x equals zero. Right, it's not going to cross x, x equals zero, but Technically, not being able to cross x equals zero is okay because we can have a limit even if the function's undefined there, right? Just so long as the function is approaching some real number value. But when we approach, so when, when a function approaches a vertical asymptote, is it approaching a real number? No. no. It, we say it is either increasing or decreasing without bound is what we call that, which means that it's going up so quickly or down so quickly that it goes towards either negative infinity or positive infinity, both not real numbers before it gets to this asymptote, before it gets to that value. So it's, we would say it's not approaching a real number. And if it doesn't approach a real number, if we can't get closer and closer to some real number, then there's no limit. Does that make sense to everybody? Cool. All right. Now we're going to have a little bit of fun with this. Okay. As if you thought this, it couldn't get any more fun. It's going to get even more fun and exciting now. We're going to take a look at the limit as x approaches zero of the function sine of one over x. And I'm sure you're all like perfectly familiar with the function sine of one over x, right? This is the part where you don't lie to me and you say no. No, I've never thought about that function in my entire life, right? So, Correct. Yeah. Correct. All right, good, good. We got one honest person out there. I like it. 
So we're going to take a look at this graph and you're going to be astounded and amazed at this graph. Here it is. Look, aren't you astounded and amazed at this graph? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that, that was the right answer again. We're going to zoom in a little bit. We're looking at the limit as x approaches zero. So what's going on here? I mean, we're, it looks like we're approaching some horizontal asymptotes as we go to the left and to the, oh, that's not what I meant to do. So we go to the left and as we go to the right. But what's going on as we go towards zero? You can't see it. You can't, you can't see it, right? It's hard to, it's hard to figure out what's going on with that. True? Um, let me just keep zooming in. And this is the part where like, if we were in the classroom, I'd say something about like some sort of, I don't know, bad acid trip going off into like some sort of like, I don't know, other dimension or something. I don't even know what I would say. Um, but it looks like, what is this function doing? It looks like it's oscillating back and forth, right? A whole heck of a lot of times, true? In fact, with increasing frequency as the function goes towards zero. True? True. True. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I would say it definitely looks like that. And it looks like each of those oscillations gets up here to a value of x, or sorry, y equals one, right? There's all these different values where y equals one. And they all drop down all the way down to these values where y equals negative one, right? It's, it's never going below or above negative one and one. True? Did you all agree? Yes. Okay. Spectacular. So how can we, like we did the other day, like with sine x over x, we zoomed in, right? And we tried to have a general idea of what it's approaching. Well, I've zoomed in a lot. You got a general idea of what it's approaching there at x equals zero, somewhere in the middle of this giant red block of nonsense? No. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to see what it might be approaching, right? I mean, let me zoom in some more. How about now? Maybe go some more. Oh, a little bit more. Okay, I'll go a little bit more. I'm zooming in some more. How about now? Can you tell now? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Perfect. What's it approaching? Um. Yeah, that's what I thought. And right, no matter how much I zoom in on this, let me go back to where it's supposed to be here. Doesn't matter how much I zoom in on that. I'm not going to be able to get a good idea of what's going on with that graph. I might. <laughs> think that it's oscillating back and forth forever from one to negative one to one to negative one. Um, but that doesn't mean that as I get towards zero, maybe it, maybe it stops doing that. And maybe there ends up being some number that it approaches. Maybe it approaches zero or maybe it approaches one or negative one, right? Those seem like values that it could be approaching. So let's see if we can find a way to prove that as x approaches zero, this function does not narrow out into some value of, let's say, zero, where these oscillations are getting shorter and shorter and maybe approaching zero. So we can see something like, this will be fun. I think it's this one. Yeah, see like this one? Watch this one, x sine of one over x. As I zoom in on this one, it's got all these oscillations, right? but they seem to be narrowing out, don't they? And the more I zoom in, we get closer and closer to a value of zero, it looks like, but for just sine of one over X, it's not, doesn't look like it's doing that. So we're gonna try and prove that it's not doing something like that. Good or no? Yeah. All right, so how do we prove that then? That's the question. How can we prove that it's not doing that narrowing thing that I just showed you on the one that I threw an X in front of it on? And I think if it's equation wise, then just do sine negative one of zero equals one over X. And then 
Okay, so yeah, so what you're saying is solve for solve for x. Something Basically. like that. Yeah, that, that's exactly what we do want to do. We want to solve for x. Um, we want to figure out the x values if this thing function hit y equals one. So we want to know when does the sine of one over x equal one. And we're also going to try and figure out when does the sine of one over x equal negative. And if we can show that it hits one over sine of one over x equals one an infinite number of times as we go towards zero, and it also hits negative one an infinite number of times as we go towards zero, then that should tell us that it's not doing this narrowing out thing that these oscillations hit one, then negative one, then back to one, then back to negative one, and back to one over and over and over again infinitely as we go towards zero. Everybody okay conceptually with what we're trying to show? Yeah. All right. Cool. So let's see if we can do that. When does the sine of one over x equal one? Well, whenever the angle, and our angle happens to be one over x, equals one. The sine of what is one? 90. 90. Let's do radians. So, oh. Yeah, we're going to do almost exclusively radians. So, pi over two. Yeah, pi over two. Okay. So pi over two, but not just pi over two, right? Um, it also hits one at pi over two plus two pi, and also at pi over two plus two pi plus another two pi, and also at pi over two plus two pi plus two pi plus another two pi. How do we write that algebraically so I don't have to write all of those? Plus or minus two pi. Yeah. Plus, well, plus plus or minus, and I'm just going to write the plus. Plus two pi, and I'm going to write n, where n is any integer. And that'll take care of the plus or the minus. And it also takes care of when n is equal to zero. So if n is zero, then it's just pi over two. But if n is one, then it's you know, five pi over two. If n is negative one, then it's negative three pi over two, and so on. I could have n equals two, n equals three, n equals four, n equals a thousand, and those will all be values at which this angle, one over x, gives us a sine of one. Everybody good with that? That's something you should have done, hopefully, last year, was solving these on infinite intervals with like a plus two pi in. Yes. Mm, oh, good. Okay. And what about this other one? This one, we want the angle, 1 over x, to equal, well, when does sine equal negative 1? 3 pi over 2. 3 pi over 2. Or 3 pi over 2 plus 2 pi, or plus 4 pi, or plus 6 pi, or plus 8 pi, or minus 2 pi, right? So plus 2 pi n, where n is any integer. I'll just not write that again. We'll assume that that applies to both these ends. So now all we have to do is solve for x. How do I solve for x? You should just be able to say, well, if I want to take the reciprocal of this side, I got to take the reciprocal of this side. So x should equal 1 over pi over 2 plus 2 pi n. And over here, x ought to equal 1 over. 3 pi over 2 plus 2 pi n. Good or no? Yes. Okay. So let's think about then what happens if I plug in integers into n here. So let's start with n equals 0. If n equals 0, I get 1 over pi over 2, right? Well, what's 1 divided by pi over 2? That ought to be 2 over pi, right? And what if n is 1? I've got 1 over pi over 2 plus 2 pi. Pi over 2 plus 2 pi is 5 pi over 2, right? So I've got 1 over 5 pi over 2, which ought to be 2 over 5 pi. And what about the next one? As n gets up to n equals 2, 
what am I going to have? This denominator is going to become 9 pi over 2. So when I take 1 over that, it ought to be 2 over 9 pi. And so on, right? The next one will be 2 over 13 pi and 2 over 17 pi and 2 over 21 pi and so on. Everybody good with that? Agree with that? Yeah. Okay. And then what about over here? If n is 0, I've got 1 over 3 pi over 2, which is 2 over 3 pi. And then if I add 2 pi to that, that's going to be a 7 pi over 2 down here. So I'm going to get a 2 over 7 pi. And, and the denominators are just going to increase by 4 pi each time over here also, right? Just on a slightly different interval there. And how long or how many of these, how long is this going to go on? How many of these x values am I going to get? Infinite. Infinite. I'm going to get an infinite number of them, right? Because there are an infinite number of integers. And same here, I'm going to get an infinite number of these x values, right? Well, what can you tell me about the relationship between 2 over pi and 2 over 5 pi? Which one is bigger? Two over pi. Two over pi is bigger than two over five pi, right? And two over five pi is bigger than two over nine pi. And the next one here is going to be smaller again, right? And the next one will be smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so there are an infinite number of these values that make sine of one over x equal to one. And each of those values is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and closer and closer and closer to zero, aren't they? If I go 2 over pi, and then 2 over 5 pi, and then 2 over 9 pi, and 2 over 13 pi, and 2 over 17 pi, those numbers are getting closer and closer and closer to zero. But they never stop. There are an infinite number of them. And so this is telling us that these oscillations go up to 1 and back down to negative 1, and up to 1, and back down to negative 1, and up to 1, and back down to negative 1, an infinite number of times as x approaches zero. So we would say that the graph oscillates between negative one and one with increasing frequency as x approaches zero and the limit can't exist because there are an infinite number of these times where it goes back and forth and back and forth and therefore it can't be narrowing out to some number it can't be narrowing out to zero or narrowing out to one or to negative one or anything in between because it always goes back to one and back down to negative one and back up to one and back down to negative one good or no That's a lot of me just like talking, but. Any issues with that? No. All right. Let's see. What do we got? We got like 15 minutes left, yeah? Let's, uh, let's move on. Why as well, right? So we've talked about pretty much all of the different, not all, but um, all of the basic methods of how to find limits. So we're going to kind of expand out our idea of limits a little bit. Um, everything we've been doing so far with a limit where it says like the limit is x approaches 7 of 5x plus 2. Well, that's, we call that a limit, or sometimes we call it a two-sided limit. Um, because we are concerned about what's happening as we approach that a value from both the left side and the right side. But sometimes we might only be interested in approaching that value of a from either the left or from the right. And so in those cases, we have what's called left-hand limits and right-hand limits. Those are both one-sided limits. So the only difference for a left-hand limit in terms of notation is a little minus sign there, which tells you it's coming from the negative side or from the left. And the only difference here is the right hand limit has a little plus sign to indicate that it's coming from the right hand side rather than from both sides or the positive side. Okay? And the, all of the exact same rules will apply, except that instead of having to have an interval surrounding that A value, you just have to have for the left hand limit an interval to the left of it. And for the right hand limit, all you have to have is an interval to the right. It doesn't matter what happens on the other side. It doesn't matter for a right hand limit what happens to the left at all. 
And for a left hand limit, it doesn't matter what happens to the right at all. And as long as we can approach some number from the left or from the right, and we can get as close to that number as we want, just like our regular limits, then we say that the one sided limit exists. Good or no? Yeah. Okay. So let's take a look at the function radical x minus 2. What does that function look like? got a domain of 2 to infinity. It looks something like that, right? Do you all agree with that? Yes. OK. As I approach 2 from the right-hand side, this is a right-hand limit here, right? The limit as x approaches 2 from the positive side of f of x. Well, what should that equal? Let's see. Do I have? an open interval to the right of x equals 2. Is there some interval over here of my function being continuous and defined? Yes. Yeah, so all that matters is what am I getting close to? Zero. Getting close to zero, exactly. What about from the left-hand side? First question we should ask ourselves is, is there an interval to the left of this x equals 2 value, where our function is continuous and defined. Anything over here for my function? No. 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 So we would say that this limit does not exist, because there is no open interval to the left of x equals 2. Everybody good with that? Yeah. Cool. All right. What do you mean by open interval? Um, I just mean that there is some interval over there, basically. Um, it doesn't have to end anywhere. It could go on forever. It just has to have, you know, it has to have something over here, whether it has an open circle at the end, a filled in circle at the end, um, oh, okay. an arrow. It just has to have some interval over there that exists. Okay, got it that's continuous to the left of that. That's all. I mean, normally when I say an open interval, I mean, you know, we could talk about like something that has an endpoint, right? These are open intervals because those last points on it are not included. This is a half open interval because one of these endpoints is included, but the other one is not. Um, so open interval just means that there doesn't have to be an included endpoint on it. All right, what about the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x? So in order to have a two-sided limit, or a limit like we've been doing, there has to be some number that we are approaching both from the left and from the right. So is there something that we are approaching both from the left and from the right of this function? Does our function exist both to the left and to the right of x equals 2? It does not. It does not exist to the left. Therefore, this limit cannot exist. There cannot be a two-sided limit if one of the sides does not exist. Good or no? Yeah. All right. So that brings us to an exceptionally important rule about uh, the relationship between one-sided limits and two-sided limits. And that is that the limit as x approaches a of a function, which is the two-sided limit, the two-sided limit can only exist if and only if the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit both equal the same numeric value. So if from the left and from the right, we get different values for those limits, the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit are different, even if they both exist, the two-sided limit does not exist. Okay. Good or no? Good. Okay. It also tells us that if we do have a two-sided limit, that the limit from the left and the limit from the right must be the same. So we can 
sort of go the opposite way with this. All right. So let's take a look at another one of these. Let's look at the graph of the absolute value of x over x. Anybody know what that graph looks like? Should have a general idea of what it looks like, I hope, but maybe. It is in our, in our notes also. What? It's given to us in our notes. It's given to you in your notes? Like we have it put in already. Oh, weird. That's strange. I don't remember doing that, but OK. Um, so you know what it looks like then. <laughs> looks like this. Pretend that those are nice, straight, horizontal lines there, right? That's what it looks like, yeah? Yes. Yeah, good. Um, this is a graph that you should become familiar with, right? You should become familiar with the graph of absolute value of x over x. It just looks like a ray going to the left with an open interval or with an open endpoint here at x equals 0 and a ray at x equals 0 going to the right also at 1 and at negative 1. So as I approach 0 from the left, what y value am I getting close to? Negative one. Should be getting close to negative one, right? I mean, in fact, we're negative one the whole time, but that's good enough. And um, what about from the right-hand side? One. Should be one. And then, based on that last rule that we just had, what's the limit as x approaches 0? Does not exist. Doesn't exist. It does not exist. Exactly. Good. Um, so we're going to stop there. And actually, tomorrow we're going to come back. We're going to do this exact same problem again, except we're going to do it algebraically and show um, algebraically why this is true, not just by looking at it.